So March was a great month to be a Steam Deck fan, but with the spring sale and all, and sure enough, I took full advantage of that sale by grabbing a ton of new games for my Steam Deck. However, I did also eke out a few last minute purchases during the spring sale, and a few games that were admittedly not on sale, I just really, really wanted them. So all that being said, today's video is all about the games that I picked up in March, starting with Generation Zero. Generation Zero is an open world co-op FPS survival game. Now I tried this out briefly when I was testing Game Pass on the deck a few weeks back, and decided I would go ahead and grab a native copy for the deck. Taking place in an alt-history 1989 Sweden, violent robots have taken over, the local populace has vanished amidst the invasion, and you have to survive sorting out how to get the upper hand on the much stronger machines you'll encounter roaming the countryside. It's a really neat setup, and while I'm not usually big on survival crafting games, with such a unique premise I got sucked into it real quick. After customizing my character I got to work scouring houses for any supplies I could find, before making my way to a church being patrolled by a few robot dogs. With very little ammo, I took my time trying to get a read on their movements from a distance before finally making my way inside for Sanctuary. And even though it's still early in what's looking to be a fairly lengthy campaign, it was thrilling enough to keep me hooked and kind of reminded me of The Evil Within too. I mean, yes, every open world survival game has a hint of existential horror in it, but this felt more like a survival horror game than an open world action game. Outsmarting patrolling robots feels great, and getting the upper hand on them feels even better, especially when you can harvest their metal corpses for supplies. The map looks to be pretty extensive as well, and at some point I'll have to try out the co-op here because there were a few skirmishes where I felt hopelessly outnumbered and only barely scraped out a victory. And when I do find a game in this vein that clicks with me, it's usually because even the tiniest victories feel significant. It took me the better part of an hour to get something more substantial than a pistol in my arsenal, and while I was pretty squishy with no body armor to speak of, it was real satisfying lighting up one of those robot dogs with a shotgun that had been giving me such a headache earlier. From a performance standpoint, it runs reasonably well on the deck at default settings, although I scaled things back like SSAO and disable motion blur to eke out a slightly higher frame rate. And it's looking to be a prime candidate for locking the frame and refresh rates to 40 or 50. But even so, I'm having a lot of fun trying to survive with a range of cybernetic killers tracking me, and I can't wait to spend more time with this one. And speaking of open world survival crafting games, I actually did go for another game in the genre this month, weirdly enough, although this one is strictly a single player affair and one that I've passed on pretty much ever since it launched, and that is Subnautica. You know how they say not to judge a book by its cover? Well, like an idiot, I judged the heck out of Subnautica since it launched back in 2018. For whatever reason, I never looked past its cover art and I just sort of wrote it off and that was a huge mistake because Subnautica is completely thrilling. Like Generation Zero, it's also an open world survival game, although this one is set in the ocean after you've crash landed on Alien Planet 4546B. You'll have to manage your hunger and thirst, all while surviving initially from a small life pod floating in the ocean. It has the basics like a fabricator for creating tools, food, and water, and some basic medical supplies. But you'll have to go out scavenging the depths of the sea to find the rest of what you need and push the story forward. In time, you'll begin building underwater bases and more capable equipment like swim fins or an oxygen tank to venture out further and further from the relative safety of your underwater safe havens. And the gameplay here is completely addictive. It seems like everywhere I turned, I was discovering new life forms and resources. Unlike Generation Zero, this is a single player only affair, but very much like Generation Zero, this definitely feels like a horror game as well. This this hit me like a ton of bricks the first time I was in an underwater cave looking for minerals and my light ran out of juice. And it's scary not just because you can hear aggressive creatures all around you, but even if I survived some aquatic predator, I still had to find my way back out of the cave in the darkness before running out of oxygen. It's nerve wracking and relaxing all at once and the whole formula works incredibly well, so I'm really glad that I finally dove in, no pun intended. And apparently this was the perfect game for me to jump into because it looks like the developers just recently released an update to make it a verified experience on the deck and it definitely plays smoothly. The initial load time might take a while, but beyond that, once you're in, medium quality settings seem to keep the frame rate pretty close to 60 for the most part. So far, the whole thing seems to strike a really good balance of play experiences. Sometimes I hop in for a few minutes just to harvest a few resources and make sure I have food and water, and other times I'm playing pulled up to my computer so I can quickly research crafting recipes and figure out what I should prioritize in the name of survival. At the risk of making more nautical puns, there is some real depth in Subnautica and I just can't wait to explore more of it. And speaking of games that I passed on initially, especially those that are outside of my preferred genres, is Midnight Suns. So I've been a Marvel fan ever since I was seven years old when my dad and I would spend every Saturday morning doing exactly two things. We would go get breakfast at Burger King and then we would go to a local comic shop to collect issues of Iron Man and Web of Spider-Man. But despite my love for Marvel, I was really hesitant about Midnight Suns. Partially because the Avengers game was cool until its story was over and then it just sort of petered out, but also this isn't an action game, but rather a tactical role-playing game in the vein of XCOM. Now I respect what games like that do, but it just never really was my preferred genre. Which is weird because I'd never really batted an eye about getting engrossed in a turn-based RPG, but tactical games like this just never really did it for me. Or at least until now, because man, I really misjudged Midnight Suns and I'm really glad that I picked it up on sale last week. 
It's too early for me to tell how great the story is, but I will say that the heroes are well voice acted, and they feel like Marvel the same way the Guardians of the Galaxy game did when I ran through that game a couple of years back. But more than the story or just generally being biased towards Marvel's heroes, I've really started to develop an appreciation for what's on offer here. In a nutshell, you'll be sorting through randomly drawn cards to try and choose the right attacks or buffs at the right time to pummel your enemies with a bunch of signature attacks from Tony's Repulsor Blast to Strange's Winds of Watoom. Meanwhile, from a story perspective, you'll be playing as the Hunter, which admittedly is kind of a generic avatar for the player, but I still found myself enjoying the combat and time spent chatting back and forth with a bunch of classic Marvel heroes. Speaking of, when you're not in combat, you'll be spending your time in the Abbey, a pocket dimension in Massachusetts. It's not exactly doling out persona levels of side activities and relationship building, but it serves up a decent enough breather in between skirmishes. Now, I did have to tinker a little bit with the visuals to get it at a frame rate I was comfortable with, but it's definitely playable on the Steam Deck. The battles seem to remain mostly smooth with occasional hitches when a lot of particle effects are on screen, but the visuals seem to take a bigger hit running around the Abbey, which makes sense considering it's a less confined space than when you're in battle. So it's not the best looking game I've seen on the deck, but it's at least passable and I have zero reservations about continuing to play it there. Though I will definitely be keeping a backup battery nearby because this thing is pretty taxing, giving you about an hour to an hour and a half of play if you're going the handheld route. And next up is a game that runs absolutely great on the deck and is way less taxing than Midnight Suns, and that is Blaze Rush. Now this game isn't exactly new to me, and I actually first played it in VR a few years back, around the same time that I first played Lucky's Tale, and sort of like Lucky's Tale when I played it, I was like, you know, we really don't need VR to enjoy this game, and sure enough, when I saw it pop back up, I figured I would go ahead and take the leap and try it out on the Steam Deck. Now again, originally I bought this on the Oculus Rift a few years back, and the reason I got this is because one of my earliest and favorite multiplayer experiences was playing a game called Super Offroad on the NES. I have these vivid memories of sitting on the floor with a few of my friends with an NES multi-tap, just so all four of us could play and race around these overhead tracks. And I have to believe that was at least part of the influence behind Blaze Rush, but you know what? Super Offroad never gave you a minigun or saw blades to blast your opponents off the course. At its core, it's a pretty simple arcade racer. You move around the track with the analog stick, and you can pick up boosts and weapons along the way. But there is an element of strategy in Blaze Rush. Depending on the vehicle type, you might have more armor at the expense of speed, or more maneuverability at the expense of resilience when your opponents are pelting you with machine gun fire in the final stretch. As you keep winning races, you'll unlock more drivers and trophies and tracks, and they mix it up a little bit with different race types as well, including one where you want to just outrun your opponents as long as possible while a giant grinder chases you down. And again, this isn't a taxing game by any stretch of the imagination. You'll get a flat or nearly flat 60 FPS pretty much at max settings and probably six to eight hours of battery life if you really want to do a marathon session of top-down combat racing. But more likely, it'll probably serve you as a good cooldown game in between larger, more taxing titles. And finally, speaking of larger, more taxing titles that I finally decided to give a fair shake, the final entry on this list is Far Cry Primal. Now, I guess I could have lumped this in with Subnautica and Generation Zero technically, since it's also an open world survival crafting game, but honestly, it feels just so much like a standard Ubisoft open world game that I really didn't feel right lumping it in with those. However, it's definitely a departure from your standard Far Cry gameplay and story. In Far Cry Primal, you'll play as one of the earliest humans in 10,000 BC, and you'll be reading a lot of subtitles as these prehistoric humans are speaking more primitively and not in standard English, which honestly I kind of loved because it forces you to pay closer attention to the other characters you'll meet and how the story's playing out. Naturally, being set in prehistoric times means that you will not be mowing down any enemies with a machine gun, but rather you will rely on basic weapons like slings, clubs, or a bow and arrow to both defend yourself and hunt down local wildlife for food and materials to upgrade the gear at your disposal. If you've ever played an open world Ubisoft game before, you won't have much trouble getting acclimated to it, but I will say that I was surprised at how enjoyable it was even without a lot of the modern weaponry that I expect in these types of games. The frame rate was hovering around the 50s at default settings, but ultimately in handheld I opted to use the high graphics preset and then lock the screen and refresh rate to 40, which seemed to hold pretty steady. What's more annoying is that it does have Ubisoft's goofy launcher that you have to contend with initially, which isn't really a deal breaker, but I always cringe a little bit when games like this make me jump through hoops for no good reason. But annoying launchers aside, I'm not sure if I'll have as much fun here as I did bombing around Yara when I played Far Cry 6 a couple of years back, but I see now I definitely shouldn't have dismissed Far Cry Primal so quickly when it first launched. So I imagine this will be a fun game to hop into now and again if I get the urge to go hunting woolly mammoths, or just beat on people with a flaming club. All right, so that's it for this one, and I really feel like the theme for March for me was just games outside of my comfort zone, because again, a lot of these games I just completely ignored during their launch, or I just assumed because they were in a different genre that I probably wouldn't enjoy them. So kind of fun for me to kind of discover a few new games that were, again, outside of my wheelhouse, but ended up being a really good time. So what about you? Did you find any games during the sale that you wouldn't normally play, but ended up being a really good experience? If so, I would love to hear about it. As always, thank you so much for your time. Take care, and I'll see you on the next one.